Perfect. So we're going to finish the lecture on Sorel today. And we're going to start Nietzsche. And Nietzsche works very well with Sorel. Well, Nietzsche works very well with almost anybody on the second part of the course, actually. But Thus Spoke Zarathustra, if you haven't read Thus Spoke Zarathustra, uh, read it. It's, I, um, it's really amazing. And what becomes more amazing, because I've read it a number of times, and I was reading it again for class. I was looking through it, and I was actually started reading it again. And I found something new. What I think becomes really amazing on Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which we'll talk about the second part, so, or the, the second part of the lecture, but not the class, so we can do seminar. But it's how a lot of his concepts fit in with modern political thinkers. So for example, when he talks about violence, when he talks about force, when he talks about the state, when he talks about the self, when he talks about friend and enemy, these all come up again. Like, and Derrida uses a lot of friend and enemy that comes out of Nietzsche, and it also comes out of um, Schmidt, which we're doing next week. So it's a, it's a nice, timely connection between Nietzsche and uh, both Sorel and Schmidt. And then you'll find it in Benjamin. you also find it then in um, Zizak as well. You can kind of trace, you can try to trace the Nietzsche influence. Uh, Heidegger for sure, because we're doing one Heidegger on technology. You can kind of trace that all the way through. And I mean, Nietzsche is really, as far, as well as being extremely fun to read in terms of us both there through strong, He's a really influential, both political and philosophical thing. So, and that, that's my favorite Nietzsche text. The next one is, uh, the, other, the other one is, is The Will to Power is Art, which is edited. So, I'm gonna back up because I think it's time for you to ask me, and since you haven't, I'll just ask myself. Um, what, like, we're reading pretty much Canon text, we're reading pretty much male canon text, right? And we're reading pretty much white male canon text until we get to Fanon. Um, and I think the question is, how do you read this? And you know, I am a feminist theorist and I was hired as a feminist theorist. I've taught a lot of courses on feminism. Um, and you're saying, that's interesting because it's not popping up. Well, as one of the references said, so if you read Rape My Confessor, right? One of the references there said, he gave me a really bad reference, or a really bad rating, but he was like, she seems okay, she seems okay, but then all of a sudden you know she's got this program that's not very obvious, and the program was feminism. <laughs> and I was like, oh wow, okay, so he gave me like a two or something, right? Uh, which was kind of interesting, because he was really offended that it, it and that I wasn't um, overtly reading everything from through a feminist lens, and I don't. What I tend to do is ask a few questions, and I'm gonna ask these questions in relation to Sorel. Sorel doesn't hold up very well, um, actually, and I'll point out where he doesn't hold up very well, but I think Sorel's a nice place to ask that question. So the three questions I always ask are, what's the absence in the text? So you'll say, okay, well the absence in uh, this text is basically feminism and race. Um, is he, actually, let me do this first, then I'll give you the questions. Then, I mean, really, um, theorists can either mimic their times. Back up, don't put those three questions out, because they're coming up. So, I think why when reading something, and I'm just giving a sort of a lecture on feminism to start Sorel, a feminist reading of text. So I think when you read something, you have to ask what's absent, what's overlooked. I mean, that Derrida for sure taught us that. You can call it deconstruction, or you can simply call it taking a look at a text and saying, well, what's not there, and how are these absent? And then you have to sort of think about the fact that theorists can either mimic their times. So Freud, in a sense, in many ways, that's my other class, in many ways mimics his times. Sometimes he's ahead of them. He's ahead of them on bisexuality, for example. Um, so theorists can either mimic their t times, or they can think beyond their times, or they can lag behind. Now Nietzsche, you know, Nietzsche brilliantly thinks way beyond his times, and when, you, when he gets to anything to do with women, he really lags behind. But he had his own particular heartbreak, which, related, which then um, went into sort of issues. What he says about women is kind of interesting, and we'll talk about that when we get to it, Nietzsche. 
So I'm going to argue, or I would argue, that Sorel lags behind his times in terms of gender equality. He's awesome in terms of um, class equality. He's awesome in terms of anarchism. He's awesome in terms of labor syndicates. He's not good in terms of feminism. So I think if you're going to make that argument, if you're going to take a look at, a, at if you're going to take a look at thinkers in terms of, you know, where we are in history, and how does it relate to what we know? And, and that's one thing, but you also have to kind of take a look at how it relates to what they know at the time. So you have to ask yourself three questions. You really have to ask yourself, okay, what was the position of women in the time the theorist was writing? Number one. Number two, does the theorist say anything about gender at all? And if, and as second part of that question, or the second part of what you ask, if he does say it, what is it, right? So what, if anything, does the theorist say about gender? And thirdly, how do the, <clears throat> sorry, how do the theorist's writings translate in today's social conditions of so-called official gender equality? Okay, so first, okay, somebody's got to turn something on. Think back. That's you. That's okay, don't worry about it. it. Happens to me. Mine will probably go in a minute. So you have to ask these three things. What was the position of women in the time the theorist was writing? What does the theorist or thinker say about gender? And how does what they say translate into today's social conditions of, and I'm gonna say official gender equality, because we can spend time arguing whether there is gender equality or what that means, etc. right? So let's take a look at Sorel. Sorel's not doing too good. French women, of course, now remember, and I want to give you the dates on Sorel again, just in case you weren't here last week, and having said that, I needed to look at them, 1847 to 1922. Lots of social upheavals going on. Every time I go near chocolate, it makes me cough. Uh, <coughs> But it's so much fun. <coughs> Sorry. So women in France didn't get the vote until 1944. However, during the French Revolution, they were really extremely active. And what I put on line was the um, pamphlet written by a lib It's an amazing piece. It's written in 1791. Olympe de Gauche wrote the rights of women as an accounting document to the rights of men. And what she calls for in there is quite amazing. So if you want to take a look at these, and I suggest you do if you're online, I would suggest you go to it. It's right here. It's an amazing, it's an amazing piece. Sorry, maybe I'll get a cough drop. So take a look at that, and I'm going to go through some of them. So you know, Sorel's aware of this. He's informed by that. She says, Article 1. And let me pull my copy up. Woman is born free and remains equal to men in rights. Social distinctions may be based only on common utility. Another one that is important is Article 3. The principle of all sovereignty rests essentially in the nation, which is but the reuniting of woman and man. Nobody and no individual may exercise authority, which does not, which does not emanate from the nation. You take a look at 4. Liberty and justice consist in restoring that all belongs to another. Hence, the exercise of natural rights of women has no other limit than those that a perpetual tyranny of man opposes on them. Sorry, let me try that again. Liberty and justice consist in restoring all that belongs to another. Hence, the exercise of the natural rights of woman has no other limits than those that the perpetual tyranny of man opposes to them. These limits must be reformed according to the laws of nature and reason. And number six, where she talks about the general will, I 
and law being an expression of the general will, she says all citizens, all citizens and all citizeness and citizens should take part in person by their representatives in its formation. It must be the same for everyone. All citizenness, I mean that's active citizenship, and citizens being equal in its eyes should be equally admissible to all public dignities, offices and employments according to their ability and with no other distinction than that of their virtues and talents, where no woman is exempted. And she says that basically when you get to seven, that no woman is exempted and she must suffer the same penalty as this man. If she's arrested and detained, it's determined by law and there's no distinction. And number 10, I'll just pull down to 10 here. No one should be disturbed for his fundamental opinions. Woman has the right to mount the scaffold so she, because they're hanging women. So she should have the right equally to mount the rostrum, which is a lecture podium, provided that these manifestations do not trouble public order as established by law. And if you go to the bottom of it, I want to just also read you 17, and then if you go to the bottom, there's a marriage contract. So 17 is really radical as well. Property belongs to both sexes, whether united or separated. It is for each of them an inviolable and sacred right, and no one may be deprived of it as true patrimony of nature, except when public necessity certified by law obviously requires it. And then on a condition of a just compensation in advance. She goes down, if you see down at the bottom about marriage, and it's a social, a social marriage contract. And if you take a look at the marriage contract, it's we, person and person. Hi, you can pick up your paper at break time. Or you can pick it up now, go for it. Um, I'm just going through um, the rights of women, 1791, Olympe de Gauche. Um, we, and the two people, move by our own will, unite for the length of our lives and for the duration of our mutual inclinations under the following conditions. So she talks about communal property, divide it in favor of children, that all children that you have, whether in that union or outside of it, has the right to bear the name of the fathers and mothers who've acknowledged them. So say you've got children outside of that particular marriage, they can also carry your name. They obligate, we obligate ourselves in the case of separation to divide our fortune equally and to set aside the portion the law designates for our children. So the idea is if you get divorced, you each get an equal share, which is pretty radical given that it's 1791. And Sorel knows this. So it's this, the proposed social contract, I would really say take a look at it. And let me put the bill back on. So he's informed by this. You know, if you read, when you, when you read um, Reflections on Violence, you'll see that he's got an incredible amount of history in there about the French Revolution, etc. He knew this. He could not have known it. Throughout the entire period, so if you're looking at the period of the, um, from 1792 to 95, French Revolution, post-French Revolution, women took an active part on both sides of the revolution. They organized salons, they did marches, they wrote revolutionary tracts, they wrote monarchist tracts. That is, some used the pen, some used fighting the sword. They debated, they petitioned, they marched, they lectured, they ran schools for new citizens. This particular era of women, revolutionary era women, demanded equality of rights within marriage. They demanded the right to divorce. They demanded the right to extend rights to widows in the sense that widows then got property, it didn't go to their oldest male child. And they, they wanted extended rights of widows over their minor children. They wanted public educational, publicly guaranteed educational opportunities for girls, including vocational training. They wanted public training, licensing, support for midwives, right to employment, so we know that women were active participants in the French Revolution and in the Paris Commune. They were actively defending the Commune against the government army. Inside the Commune, they, 
the commune itself implemented the right to vote for women. Women fought against prostitution, seeing it as the exploitation of women. They also fought against the stigma of children who were considered illegitimate. They, they fought, they took care of the wounded. And it's been documented that they were some of them, it's been documented in terms of images and um, what do you call it, sculptures, that they were some of the most determinate fighters on the barricades when the, the commune came under attack. Okay, so we know this. I mean, you probably knew this, but I just reminded you. Sorel knows this. For sure. So what's he say about women? Well, let's take a look at a couple of things he says. And I think we have to go back to page 50, which was in last week's readings, to take a look at this. He says at the bottom of paragraph one on page 50, if one day they give the right to vote for women, sorry, if they give the right to vote to women, Then they'll be doubtlessly um, called upon to draw the statement of the aims of this special proletariat. So what he says right there is that the proletariat, the female proletariat is quite different from the male proletariat. On page 80, he makes this really snide remark, and I think we read it last week, or no, it's not part of what we read for last week. He makes this really ridiculous snide remark about loose women talking about a reporter and he says um, what banquets there would be what loose women and what opportunities for self-display so Sorrell's in a sense I would say out of his times on gender he's proposing revolutionary violence to bring about proletarian power but on gender he's just parroting um, sort of snide gender remarks parenting social conservative gender remarks. So the question you want to ask, and you can find more of them in there, when you just uh, go to the PDF and, and do a search on women. Um, the question you want to ask, and I think it's an important question, that was uh, Mount Edna, um, is does it invalidate his theory of violence? Or what does it do to his theory of violence? Because really, his work is about a theory of violence then gets picked up and carried through to do that. I don't know the answer to that, but I think that's the, I do know that's a question you want to ask. Is what does it do, like how does it, if it does, invalidate his theory of violence? And to recap last week's lecture and go ahead, that's uh, one of Zella Turba, which is pretty awesome. Um, so let's go back. Does that make, is that clear? Has anybody got any comments or anything on like the need to ask that? Yeah. I was just going to ask about the, the page 50 quote. I don't, I don't understand what he's trying to say. If women get the right to vote, then what? Then you're going to have specific, okay, so he's just saying that if women get the right to vote there, then you're going to have like a specific proletariat inside the proletariat rather than everybody being equal. That's kind of what he's claiming. He says, then we're going to have to have the aims of a special proletariat. It's a good question. Anybody else on that? No, I can hear somebody else. So I'm covering mine. Oh, no, mine's over there. Mine. Oh, shoot. You know what I didn't do? I didn't turn it on to. I didn't record. Ed? You didn't press record? Oh, no, it's recording. Oh, okay. What I didn't do was I didn't put it on. Um, yeah, and if it's not on airplane mode, if I get a text or something, it comes in and cuts it off. So. Let